In previous lessons on this channel, we've covered Newton's laws of motion for objects moving in a straight line. In this lesson, we're going to see how to apply Newton's second law to objects moving in uniform circular motion. So what is uniform circular motion? If we have a particle, say for example a ball, and we've attached it to a string of length r. Now if we swing this ball around in a circle at a constant velocity, so the velocity of the, the ball, the tangential velocity of the ball doesn't change over time, then this ball is undergoing uniform circular motion. And the path that this ball takes will be a perfect circle. Now there's something called centripetal acceleration, which is the acceleration that this ball experiences as it's moving along this circular path. And the magnitude of this acceleration is equal to the ball's velocity squared divided by the radius of the circle. Now this acceleration is also a vector. So it has not only a size, a magnitude, but it also points in a certain direction. So our velocity here is also a vector and currently in this snapshot in time it is pointing towards the right with a certain magnitude or a certain size which is signified here by the size of this arrow. But the direction of this acceleration vector, this centripetal acceleration, always points towards the center of the circle when we have uniform circular motion. Now, if you imagine tying a piece of string to a tennis ball and swinging that around your head, you'll notice that the faster that you swing this ball, the more the ball seems to pull on the string. So the higher this velocity here, the higher the centripetal acceleration will be. Now, if you decide to lengthen your string, make your string longer and swing this ball around your head at the same speed, then this acceleration will be lower and you won't feel the same magnitude of force pulling on the string as you swing it round. Now Newton's second law can be defined as the sum of all external forces acting on an object. For example, our object is our tennis ball here, is equal to the mass of the tennis ball multiplied by the acceleration it's experiencing. In this case, it's experiencing a centripetal acceleration. So our force here is also a vector, which means that it points in a certain direction. Now our force vector points towards the center of the circle, and this is sometimes called the radial force. And this makes sense because if you imagine whirling this ball around your head, your hand that is holding the string here is continually pulling at this ball to keep it in a circular orbit. So it's your hand that is providing this radial force. We can actually combine these two equations here to see how the radial force is affected by the ball's velocity, the radius of the circle, and the ball's mass. So the sum of all the forces acting on this ball 
is equal to the ball's mass multiplied by the ball's velocity squared divided by the radius of the circle that it's moving in. If we have a ball that has a mass of 0.5 kilograms and it's attached to the end of a cord that's one meters long and the ball is then whirled in a horizontal circle. If this cord can withstand a maximum tension of 100 newtons, what is the maximum speed of this ball before this cord breaks? So again, our formula for the radial force that points towards the center of the circle is equal to the object's mass multiplied by the velocity squared divided by the radius of the circle. And if we keep this chord length the same, this radius the same here, you can see that the force of tension acting on this cord is going to increase very quickly as we increase the velocity. Now we're given the maximum tension here that this cord can withstand. And that's 100 newtons. We're also given the mass of the ball, 0.5 kilograms. We've got our radius at one meters. But we don't know the maximum velocity yet. And remember, this is the maximum velocity because we're placed in the maximum tension that the cord can withstand just before it breaks. So all we need to do is rearrange this equation to make to make the velocity the subject of the formula. So one meter multiplied by 100 newtons divided by the mass, 0 0.500 kilograms. And then we square root this to give us the velocity, the maximum velocity. And that gives us a velocity of 14.1 meters per second. And this is to three significant figures because the maximum number of significant figures in our equation here is three. Now our second problem is a bit more complicated. We have a car that weighs 1000 kilograms that's moving on a flat horizontal road as it drives around a curve. If the radius of this curve is 40 meters and the coefficient of static friction between the tires of this car and the tarmac is 0.5, find the maximum speed that this car can have without sliding off the road. I've actually done a video on friction and static friction, which you can view up here if you're not quite sure what static friction is or how it works. But if we draw out a problem quickly, we've got a car driving on a road that is curved, forming part of a circle. And the radius of the circle is equal to 40 meters. Now, if this car drives too fast, then it will start sliding off the road. And it's only this static friction here, acting between the tires and the tarmac, that is keeping the car in this circular path. Now, we're assuming here that this car is moving at a constant velocity 
in which case it's moving in uniform circular motion and its centripetal acceleration will equal the velocity squared of the car divided by the radius of the circle. Now the radial force acting on this car is going to equal the car's mass multiplied by this centripetal acceleration. And this is Newton's second law. Now our goal here is to find the maximum speed that this car can have as it's just about to skid off the road. In other words, our force of static friction, so our maximum force of static friction is equal to the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. And because our car is driving on a flat horizontal road, this means that the normal force, which is the force that acts perpendicular to the surface that the object is resting on, is equal to the car's weight. And this is true because the car it's stationary along the y-axis. So our force of static friction is going to equal our coefficient of static friction, 0.5, multiplied by the car's mass, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. Now it's this force of static friction that is keeping our car in this circular path. So this equation becomes the force of static friction, the maximum force, is equal to the car's mass multiplied by the maximum velocity squared divided by the radius of this path here. Now we've already worked out that the force of static friction is equal to the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the car's weight. So we can simply rearrange this equation to make the velocity term the subject of the formula. The masses cancel and we have the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, multiplied by the radius of the circle, and this is square rooted. Get our velocity max. And it's also worth noting here that this maximum velocity is independent of the car's mass. The only thing that affects whether the car skids off the road or not is the coefficient of static friction between the tyres and the tarmac, the acceleration due to gravity, and the radius of our circle. And it makes sense that a larger circle with a larger radius will allow us to drive around this curve at a faster speed. And with a larger coefficient of static friction, in other words, more grip between the tyres and the tarmac, the higher our velocity can be. So what is this maximum velocity? So we've got a radius of 40 metres, coefficient of static friction of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 times 9.8 metres per second squared, multiplied by 40 metres, And this gives us a value of 14 meters per second.